Hello, everyone, and welcome on the Etiquette Show on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. This is Ursula for a fabulous edition of the Ottawa Book Expo. And before I introduce you to my guest today, let me share with you some important dates. So mark your calendars and save those dates. Our main event will take place from the 26th to the 28th of August 2022 at Lanzon Park at Ottawa, obviously. So today on the Ticket Show, I have the pleasure to introduce you to my guest, Mr. Jean-François Pinsonneau, who is an organizational development practitioner, a mediator, a consultant, and a coach with over 45 years of experience. Hello, Jean-François. Thank you so much for being here with us today on the Ticket Show. Good day, Ursula. Yes, I'm very glad to be here and I'm, I feel honored. Thank you so much. Welcome and welcome to all of you who's watching us today. So Jean-François, before we start and I talk about your impressive background and career, let me remind to everyone that if you are an exhibitor, actually you, Jean-François, you are an exhibitor uh, during the Pride weekend in Ottawa. And if you who's watching us want to be an exhibitor too, we invite you and everybody and other authors to visit ottawabookexpo.ca and if you like information on how to have a virtual exhibitor booth, please contact us on the website. So uh, we will help you to, uh, well, to show your fabulous work just as Jean-François is doing right now. So Jean-François, you teach courses on conflict resolution, communication, customer service, process improvement, and leadership management skills. You are a specialist in home safety assessment for seniors, right? Certified by HSafe Canada. And you give seniors and their families um, practical advice on home safety. Indeed, you are the author of Aging at Home, Yes You Can, uh, which will be available in French by the end of the year. But for now, it's available in English. Can you tell us more about your book and why did you decide to write about uh, senior safety at home? Well, thank you. Um, it started a long time ago when I was young and I was ill and my parents took care of me. And as I grew older, I, I made a decision that if they ever needed me, uh, I would do everything in my power to support them. And, uh, and that's what happened. Uh, in uh, 1982, my mom got, uh, my, my father passed away in 1980 uh, in, in his sleep from a heart attack. And uh, my mother in 1982 was extremely ill. And after spending several uh, months in the hospital, uh, her doctors uh, couldn't do anything more. She had to go uh, and recuperate over time. And uh, they wanted to put her in a, a long-term care. And unfortunately, my siblings were agreeing to this uh, approach, and but I was not. And uh, I knew my mother wanted to go back home. So I took charge of everything. I... Uh, I hired a live-in companion uh, who lived with her. And for a 10-year period, um, I visited my mother every, every other week and would kind of give some time off to the companion and chat with my mother and find out, you know, some of the uh, things that were going on because I wasn't there during the week. I was only there on weekends. And of course, vacation. I would go my vacation because, you know, she lived on the on our farmhouse where I was born and raised and everything. So it was a nice place to go on vacation. Um, and a lot of things that I learned was uh, some of the challenges that el elderly people uh, face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and so uh, I would listen, ask questions, and then I would fix it. I would remedy it. I would arrange it. I would uh, remove it if it was an obstacle uh, because I didn't want her to fall. And so I wrote, uh, I, she, unfortunately she passed away in 1996 uh, from a, a, heart, a heart stroke, and uh, which was very difficult, but uh, I tried to write uh, a memoir, but it uh, was very painful and emotional for me. And it took a while. Uh, I retired from uh, a permanent work at the end of uh, 2011 uh, and then decided that I needed to do something. I had a good friend who had a system called the Passion Test, which she administered to me and it identified uh, things that I wanted to do. And the thing that came on top was to write a memoir. 
uh, to about my my journey, my odyssey, mm -hmm. mother. So I did. Uh, the book is called Lasting Touch, and it was mm -hmm. uh, um, published in uh, 2017. Fast forward to 2020, uh, we have the pandemic that hits us uh, in uh, early of the year. And uh, like many, I was glued to the news and the TV and to the written uh, reports about, uh, you know, casualties and so forth. But mm -hmm. one of the things that really uh, made me extremely angry, and it's it's an unusual thing for me because I'm not an angry person. I never was, uh, but I did. Uh, and I, I was very upset at how uh, governments, uh, provincial, territorial, municipal, were really Mm -hmm. uh, lackadaisical as to how to uh, deal with the seniors because a, a significant portion of uh, victims of COVID-19 uh, were seniors. Mm -hmm. So I decided because I had the experience with my mother, then I would write a book. Uh, and that sent me on that path. That's uh, that's very interesting, and that's uh, incredible that you decided to to do this after personal experience that, as you said, was very uh, maybe difficult at that time. So, talking about lasting touch, you talk about your experience, uh, what you shared with your mother, um, and uh, at that moment, and you deal with themes such as communication, tolerance. Um, with love, obviously, because it's, it's family, you, you took care of your mom, as you said. Uh, we talk about independence, too, because it's important. You know, uh, your mother wanted to, to be at home with you, but at some point, you know, she still wants to have um, control and authority over her life, which is very important for seniors. So we have to, to, re to, to remind this. How was the process of writing this book? Because it is not easy, as I say, it is painful. But how was this process of writing uh, such intimate experience? Well, I had some experiences, but they were limited, you know, to the, my mother's environment. And, uh, I cared for her for nearly 15 years. The first 10 years was in her own home in, at the farmhouse. But then one day in between visits, she called me uh, and asked if the offer was still good because I was regularly offering her to come and live with me. And I said, of course. And then so I was living in the Ottawa region. So I bought a house that was met as much as possible her needs and then adapted the rest of it to make it comfortable. So she would be as independent as possible. She would have as much control as possible. Uh, and communication was the key. You know, what is she saying? What is she not saying? Often, you know, that's a big piece because seniors of time don't necessarily necessarily want to bother their children or impose and so right. forth. So all with all this, I decided then it, it was in June 2020 when I said, okay, get off your butt, excuse me, but you got to do something. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, I, uh, I started researching the best practices worldwide. How do other countries, because Canada is not doing a good job about it, how do other countries uh, do and, and what kind of processes and system? And what I dis discovered uh, in the OECD countries, which are about 30 or 40 countries, uh, many of the uh, many other countries like Sweden, Poland, Denmark, uh, Norway, United Kingdom, uh, Iceland, they have a much higher focus on on seniors than we do in Canada. Canada spends uh, about thirty percent, thirteen percent of its health budget on home care and community care. These countries spend upwards of fifty percent, and with Denmark being the gold standard at sixty three percent. Because it has shown clearly, they started that in 1980, that the seniors are more comfortable, they're in their own home, and they are able to, because many of the chronic diseases that were not thought about in the mid-1950s when our health system was put, uh, pulled together, it was more around acute situations. But chronic situations were low on, on the priority list. Today, they're very high. But a lot of the chronic diseases uh, like diabetes and uh, even uh, all, you know, dementia and so forth, a lot of it at one point with home care and community care can be dealt with at home, in the home. So 
So this is very interesting. And can you tell us more about why uh, it will be maybe better for a senior to, to, to stay at home and to organize everything so that the senior uh, can stay at home in his environment? Why that? It's their environment. They they can uh, they can picture and they can see things that they were they've been there for many years. It could be a house, a condo, an apartment, uh, you know, a, a cottage, whatever. It can be any type of dwelling where they are comfortable, and it's usually in the a neighborhood that they're familiar with. In other words, they're close to the bank, close to the pharmacy, close to the grocery store, uh, hopefully close to some sort of transit transportation system so that if they can't drive anymore, they can use a public transit. And often they may even have family members within driving range uh, or close by. So being in their own home makes it easier for them to find comfort. And so, for instance, when my mom moved from the farmhouse to the house that I bought for her near Ottawa, I brought, I would say, after it was all done, 90% of the furniture in the home was in her home. Okay, so I see. When, when she arrived, I remember she arrived on Halloween night, <laughs> on the 31st of October uh, wow. in 1992. Uh, she had my sister had picked her up the day before. My sister lives in nearby, and she she spent a day and a half with my mom uh, with my sister until well, I set up all the house and, and moved everything. And then when she arrived, my mother had tunnel vision in, in the early days, and she's moving her head because that's how she can make a picture of. And she says, "Why did you bring me back to the farmhouse? Because huh. it was all her furniture." That's awesome. <laughs> That's you know, awesome. Until she all of a sudden she says, "Oh, I know it's not. There's a fireplace. Your dad never built me one," <laughs> which is funny, kind of. So, <laughs> but I purposely made sure there would be a you know a a fireplace in the living room because she always I remember hearing about it all the time. She would love to have a fireplace. So this is you know it makes it more comfortable. Even during the last uh, months, because she she was uh, very ill, she had a stroke, and she was she was put under a medically induced coma. Uh, and when she came out, she was paralyzed the entire left side. Mm -hmm. So then I could no longer bring her home. Her leg was, you know, in a kind of a sitting position. Her left arm was behind her back, and she was frozen. And she couldn't even speak French anymore. She could understand English uh, because we were bilingual. But when uh, when I spoke to her in French, she understood, but she responded in English. That lasted a couple of months. And so yeah. when I had to move her into a long-term care for the last few months, I found a place that was unfurnished and I brought her bed, her bedspread, the family pictures, her dresser, her night, you know, the, the bread, the bedspread, curtains and everything. So even when she arrived there, she says, oh, it looks like my old bedroom, you know, and so it makes the familiarity breeds mm -hmm. comfort and increases the quality of life. And well, who said quality says obviously safety. So well, it's uh, it's it's very ob obvious now. You you're telling us that. Um, what would you say that? Well, how the pandemic actually um, changed the um, let's say the, the the experience or the decisions of seniors being at home versus being in a specialized establishment. How did it impact that much the seniors? Well, they saw where the, the, the deaths occurred. They occurred in the long-term care, they occurred in retirement homes, and they occurred in hospitals. And so there was a survey done at the end of 2020, early 2021, before we had access to vaccines uh, that uh, resulted that 97% of seniors that were surveyed said they would do everything in their power to remain in the home of their choice. And so that's why I decided to do research, to find the best practices, and then pull it all together into a kind of a resource book uh, 
which covers the outside if it's pertinent, but it's always pertinent because there's the entrances to your home. So the, the walkways, sidewalk, whatever. So that's, that's an important piece. And of course, uh, the major uh, 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 chapter in the book is the interior, room by room, examples and issues. And what I tried to do in my research, I found that some, there are books on aging in place, uh, but a lot of these books could talk about expensive changes. And generally speaking, seniors are not that wealthy. Uh, the wealthy one are not even bothered by anything. They live in all sorts of very high-end situations and can afford all sorts of situations. But the average seniors in Canada cannot. Mm -hmm. And so I focus my attention on identifying uh, issues that could be resolved often at no cost whatsoever. Uh, area rugs are absolutely most dangerous thing possible to have. Oh, they're pretty, but they're slippery. So the best thing is to remove them, but if you intend on keeping them, they need to have a double-sided tape on the perimeter of the rug so that they don't slide. Having a bench or a table or chair on the, on the entrance to the house, so when you come in with parcels or packages, you put the stuff on the table or the chair, then you unlock and then go in. And even the locks, the locks should be requiring keys to lock. It should be not like in hotels that when the door closes, it's locked. Because if you go out to get your mail and the door closes and you're in your jammies and you don't have a key and it's yes. in the middle of winter, it's not optimum. And so all these ideas I, I try to find, even uh, doorways, often there are people who have mobility devices and they will find that some doors older homes the doors are a, a bit narrow uh well you know often books suggest that to remove the frame and install the bigger frame a wider frame well i discovered that there is a type of hinge that you can replace and you can do it yourself because you do one hinge at the time remove one put the new one and they're called pull away hinges and it widens the door by an, a, a, approximately an inch and a half or about whatever it is in centimeter i don't remember but uh wider and sometimes that's enough it's very interesting and very valuable information as you said it's there are things that doesn't cost anything that you can what that we can apply right now and right away so i would like to emphasize that actually these are uh very important tips and advices for seniors but also for families uh for everybody actually so your book even if it was for seniors at first everyone can read your book and learn something that will be practical for themselves whatever the age that they that they are because it's it's important and it basically we all want to be safe in our environment, right? Yeah. So obviously we can get your book to learn more and um, have some practical uh, information to apply right now to, to have a better and safer environment. But you also carry out a home safety assessment to identify dangerous situations uh, that put, as we said, the health and the safety of seniors um, uh, at risk, right? And you suggest viable solutions uh, that are very specific to uh, the, the, the person's uh, situation, right? Can you tell us how does it work and what should we do to book a consultation with you? Because you are an expert, right? And we want to, we want to learn from you. So how does it work? What should we do? Definitely anyone uh, can go on my website, which is uh, www.jeanfrancoispinceau. I think they see my name there. Uh, there's no hyphen, though, on the on the uh, website, .com. So jeanfrancoispinceau, the one word, .com. And there's a place there It says consulting services, and it's fully explained. Uh, however, uh, for people who... Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I do want to stay, say that in the book, because of my uh, expertise as an uh, organizational development practitioner, I developed nine tools. And one of them is a 
self-assessment of one's home. Room by room, area by area, it's, uh, it's at the end of the book as a, an appendices, and it has nine tools that I've developed, nine tools that are unique, that are uh, would be beneficial and useful to the reader in doing their own determination and their own decision-making process. So yes, they can uh, reach out. Um, I, currently, I can do it as far as 100 kilometers from my uh, home office, which includes Ottawa to the west, because I live east of Ottawa. Uh, or even further east, south or north. Uh, otherwise, I would have to kind of include, especially with the price of gas these days, uh, <laughs> some uh, some gas coverage. Uh, but yes, they can certainly uh, go on my website to do that. Or if they prefer, uh, the book is uh, on special this month on on uh, my website. And I, of course, I will be have the same special will be available at the Ottawa Book uh, Expo uh, come August. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I would like to ask you a last question. You already shared a lot. Uh, tips and advices already. So I hope people grab them because uh, that was very uh, valuable. Um, just before I ask my question, I want to um, tell people that to share information on your website, you have a blog, you share advices and tips so people can still have information from you on your website. Obviously the book is the best because it's a lifesaver book, right? What is the most important important thing that you learn from your experience uh, or maybe like the most dangerous place in the home well we we, we talk about um uh, that the kitchen and stuff like that but what what did you learn that was very um important for you and that would you would like to share right now today for our uh, auditors that they can apply right now to help uh, the seniors if they have seniors with them at home I think it's the kitchen because we are there quite often, and uh, I, there's a tool in uh, in in the book. But very quickly, is identify things that we use on a regular basis, things we use occasionally, and things we don't use, and get rid of the things you don't use. Sell, give away uh, to charitable organization, and sometimes they're sold; they they have to be trashed or recycled. Uh, and then put all of the, you know, clean all your cupboards and put everything that is readily and easily accessible to seniors on the shelves and the pantry shelves that they can reach. All the stuff that they use regularly should be there. Uh, stuff that they use occasionally, then it should be higher because occasionally means when there's family there, then you can ask a family member to go up. And if you must have a little step ladder to reach for something, please be careful and buy a step ladder. Then when you open it up, there's a handle that comes up and you can hold on to the handle even though when you're on the third step. So very important. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, area rugs, things like uh, extension cord, uh, the cord for charging our phones, things that we can trip over uh, very easily, uh, we need to, you know, to do something and never wait. You know, I've, I've had uh, during other events, I've had seniors tell me, well, I'm not there yet. And, uh, and they would then say, when should I start? You should have started yesterday. Don't wait. Don't wait till something happens. Once you've had a broken hip, you're now going down a very slippery slope. Yeah, definitely better do things like to prevent rather than cure or something that we should have prevented before. So I, I do agree with that. Thank you so much, uh, Jean-François, for the valuable information. I, I do appreciate uh, your point of view as an expert uh, because, well, you have the theory, you have the experience, we definitely can listen to you. Again, it's not necessarily for uh, the seniors only, it's for the families. I remember when we spoke uh, someday, well, you told me uh, a, a mother um, told you she's buying it for her because she has kids and the same information will apply for her kids. So everyone, you are all invited to uh, get that book. Uh, this book, Aging from Home, yes, we can, uh, you can actually, <laughs> well, we all can, is available um, on Chapters, Indigo, and Amazon Books. 
for those of you who uh, is watching us today at home, I just want to remind you, if you want to be an exhibitor, contact us at Ottawa Book Expo. Uh, .ca. We are waiting for you. We will be there for you. We are waiting for you uh, from the 26th to the 28th. Come and visit Jean-Francois. He has a lot to share, obviously, and come uh, visit uh, our other uh, writers and authors. It will be a pleasure. Thank you so much again, uh, Jean-Francois, for everything. Thank you all for joining us for a fabulous edition of the Ottawa Book Expo on the Etiquette Show, and we'll see you by the end of August. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.